YouTuber Shane Dawson and his partner have just received twin baby boys through surrogacy after having announced that they were going through the process several months ago. And of course, there was lots of excitement, lots of support in the replies to these announcements on social media, even despite Shane Dawson's I will say interesting history of comments about children, which we'll get into in a little bit here. But that announcement came just a day or so after we saw another announcement, another case where you've got two men using surrogacy to purchase children for themselves, except this time the social media announcements were coming from Fox News contributor and Fox radio host Guy Benson. And curiously, there was lots of excitement from other conservatives who perhaps would have been really angry when it was Pete Buttigieg and the man he calls his husband doing this a little while ago, purchasing children from surrogates, doing a little photo shoot afterwards in a hospital bed and everything. But even a year or so ago, you know, when Dave Rubin announced that he was doing the same thing, we saw lots of support from conservatives for the results of gay men purchasing children together through surrogacy. And for those unfamiliar with surrogacy, it's where a woman carries a child through IVF for a couple who will then take the child from her upon birth and raise him on their own. It's been happening for a while. Female celebrities have been doing this, literally renting another woman's womb to carry a child and then parading him around afterwards like an accessory as if everything is just totally normal. But there's also been this trend that's increasingly popular of gay men using surrogates as well. And even more recently, a trend of conservatives celebrating this so long as they vote Republican because we love family values. We love the family unit and present fathers. We love present fathers in the household so much that we're doubling it. We are, we are solving the fatherlessness problem by doubling the fathers in the household. I, as a conservative, support households with two dads as long as they vote Republican. That's family values. That's the family unit. You know, we can just play creative mode with what those words actually mean, and then you just keep saying it, and that's the plan, okay? So we will go over surrogacy and the horrors of it, why it's wrong, the negative effects that we see in children who grow up in all varieties of non-nuclear households and families, some statistics about growing up in these kinds of households, some analysis of the slippery slope, the effects that these LGBT conservative figures have on the broader movement, some interesting dynamics with conservative media companies, how we got to this point in the first place where conservatives are like, yeah, well, at least our gay dads who purchase made-to-order babies are going to vote Republican, uh, why the current discourse is incapable of actually pushing back against these issues, some uncomfortable truths about these things that may help with that, why this is actually more subversive than this and so much more uh so do me a favor go ahead and stay tuned john doyle in heck off commie Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. Before we get started, I request the input of the audience. I have planned another dissertation-length video covering so many important topics. It began originally with a summary of my Twitter beef with Vivek Ramaswamy and how I was responsible for outing him as a pro-mass immigration globalist last January. Trust. I will elaborate, I promise. And it's expanded since into this very thorough, very long, very important discussion on everything from immigration policy to political strategy to then Israel-Palestine, trends in elections, voting patterns, historic understanding of American identity, all sorts of stuff. But it all fits under one very important umbrella. And I'm very excited about it. I think we're going to learn a lot. So I'm leaning towards just putting it out as one final giant video for the beginning of next year. And then we have a couple more big announcements right around the corner. Uh, but this is going to be broken up into three parts and it's going to play one after the other because I think breaking it up into segments not only helps organize it in my mind but also in the mind of the viewer. So my question is, do you actually want me to post it like part one, part two, part three? Or do you want another big video? Do you want me to just give you a giant video that happens to be broken up into three parts? I personally like putting out these giant videos. You know, one to start off the year, I think that's pretty cool. But I figure I would at least ask your opinion. But in the meantime, we've got a lot to discuss here today. And we'll be back again before the end of the year. My Christmas gift to you. Two videos in December. It's a Christmas miracle. I don't know what's going on. But anyways, last thing. One of our guys in the HOC Discord put out a book recently. It's very well written, but the content itself is really what's important. It's titled uh, Muscular Christianity. It's a case for spiritual and physical fitness. Muscular Christianity, of course, being in reference to the Christian athletic movements from the 19th century in England and the United States. I remember when I first got sent the PDF, I immediately sent it to other people, probably illegally, because I thought it was important, okay? You know, it comes with a workout program and everything, but essentially, it explains why we have to view a person not as just body and mind, the way the modern world does, not just as mind and spirit, the way, frankly, a lot of Christians do, but in a proper sense, which includes the links between the body, the mind, and the spirit, and how strength and all of these are required for you to flourish. And so check that out. I'll put a link to it in the description, a little stocking stuffer for you maybe. But yeah, I distinctly remember seeing a magazine at Kroger when I was but a boy and on the cover was a man and his stomach was inflated, giving the appearance that he was pregnant. It said like first pregnant man or something. And I was like, wow, 
That's crazy. Looking back though, I don't think the magazine was trying to claim that a woman became pregnant, but because she identifies as a man, therefore a man is pregnant. I think it was just like clickbait. You know, it was like, oh wow, freak science, check this out. Like a sideshow attraction at a carnival, a freak show or something. Like, come one, come all, first pregnant man. You know, like one of those things. But now it's just totally normal. Still got women getting pregnant, but they're presenting it far more consistently and far more disturbing a manner. And it's being presented unironically, as if it's just true, uncontroversial, pregnant men, pregnant people, whatever. So we've got that going for us. And now it's reached a point where there's so much going on. If you say, oh, these men say they're pregnant, people on our side are like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on. Uh, you're saying uh, that that woman thinks she's a man and is pregnant. Oh, well, excuse me. No, allow me to clarify what I meant. These two men have purchased a child and ordered a child from his mother whom they will raise as their own. He will never be able to meet his mother nor understand her love and warmth and nurturance despite the gap that will be left by the absence of all of that. Oh, oh, well, that's different then. Like there's this dynamic on the right where social conservatism means being anti-trans. That's it. And that's Sometimes, mostly it's being anti-trans people who vote Democrat or anti-trans surgeries, but only for minors. But on your 18th birthday, hell yes, son, you come back home with a shotgun and with no penis. It's, it's the Yellowstone meme, you know? Shoot, boy, you're 18 now. Just run up to the party store, get some fireworks. We can just do it right there in that there backyard. Some bitch already got me paying out the nose for them hormones. I'll blow the damn thing off myself. Or you've also got people who are like, well, I have no issue with the LGB. It's really just the T. That's like a common line now. There's no coherency to anything these people believe. No concept of the slippery slope. No understanding of the enemies that they're up against. And I'm the first guy, by the way, to criticize how the right has responded to the gender issue, which is by yelling, stop erasing women. Women have vaginas. Hey, you mother I'm a fucking woman. I'm a fucking woman with a fucking vagina, bitch. I will, I will fucking kill you with my pink girl AR-15 if you ever try to take my daughter's soccer trophy, you fucking bitch. Okay, like, this is what they then celebrate, though. Like, the gender conversation isn't actually about simple biology. The left is right about that. It's about the essence of gender. So, yes, of course, it's biological, but what is implied by that biology? How do men and women tend to behave? What do those implications and tendencies mean for society? Like, this is the conversation that's being had, and the right loses because too many of us don't like that conversation because while we may agree that yeah, there are some differences between men and women. We ultimately agree with the left's conclusion, at least more, more so than a serious alternative to it, which is why you get so many, well, I'm a liberal, but the left has just gone too far. Those types of people washing up on our shores. So yeah, our counter to this has been this very vulgar, hey, women don't have balls, which frankly is not a very ladylike response. But the whole point of that rhetoric is that you can't erase being a woman because women have vaginas and that's important because women use those to make babies. But then you can't celebrate these kinds of things because if two men can raise a baby, which was born from a woman's body, just like a man and a woman can raise that baby, then it really doesn't matter who has what part because everything is just interchangeable. You know, women have no unique value except for their vaginas. It'd be like, oh, I've got milk, you've got chocolate syrup, you know, let's make something happen here. No further insight into why you have milk and not chocolate syrup or vice versa. Just like, oh yeah, it is what it is. Who cares? Doesn't really matter. And if it doesn't matter, why get upset about it? You know, it's just like, who has what body parts? Then yeah, it's all just physical. It's all just physical matter. Who really cares? It's of no consequence. And that's why they're mad at the trans stuff, but then they'll celebrate gay couples using surrogates to acquire babies. And oh, gee, yes, I'm so happy for you guys. So much this. And it's because of that thinking. They actually agree with the left, which is why the outcomes always gravitate towards the left. They more or less agree that being born a man or being born a woman has no real implication for your life, for your lifestyle, behaviors, choices, interests, temperament, intelligence, ambitions, other than what society might impose upon you. And if they do, it's not significant enough to really explain the gaps that we're tending to see between uh, men and women, explaining the results of feminism, sex segregated environments, uh, being abolished, et cetera. Like effectively, since all of them are liberals, the only difference is they want to acknowledge that men and women have different genitalia because thinking otherwise would be crazy, right? Two men can raise a kid, but they can't make one. But if they pay me, I'll, I'll do it for them. And then it's a private transaction that the status better not interfere with. You gentlemen can hire me for my vagina, but you better fucking acknowledge that it's a vagina and that makes me a fucking woman. So that's kind of like where we're at. Uh, so yeah, anyways, broadly speaking, establishment right, adjacent establishment right, all the usual suspects, all their fans, they're all okay with these kinds of things. But if you're not, it's because you're homophobic or something. Even though forever we've had to hear about the family unit, the nuclear family, family value, sound of freedom, human trafficking. Okay, well, 
what is this then? You know, like, what would you call this? Ordering and purchasing a human being? What would that be then? You know, with adoption, you've got couples paying money to agencies, and it's going through this big bureaucracy and background checks and meetings and check-ins and these different agencies and supervision and training, but you can't just like straight up pay the parents for the child because that would be trafficking. That's illegal. But with this, yeah, all the money goes to the genetic mother, genetic father, the birthing mother, some combination. It's all just wrong using those modifiers on mother and father. It's literally like an order and a transaction for a human being. Like even when we focus on the culture war stuff, we can't even do it properly. It's such an absurd environment on the right where we're screaming about how men and women are different. We must defend the family. Okay, well, what is the implication of men and women being different? Like, why do, you, why do you shy away from that part? What is the extent of those differences? Can that inform our understanding of maybe the world that we live in today? If we understand men and women, understand marriage, understand the role of marriage, how all of these things are linked, there's nowhere in the system where you would accept a concession on these types of things. It's all just one sealed system. Because if two men can get married, meaning the union isn't really complementary, it's just a partnership, it's like an agreement. Okay, well, why can't they raise kids then? And if they can raise kids, well, why can't they order them from surrogates? Is that what love is? It's just a partnership with you and your best friend? Or is it something deeper? Is it something that we maybe don't even fully understand? This is the end result of social liberalism in the slippery slope. Humans are all blank slates, completely interchangeable, and therefore they can be commodified. Since the family unit has been completely abolished, total and full surrogacy, no one's related to anybody fully, we're all just mass floating around in our little commune. And further, not only do they not really acknowledge the differences between men and women, but by extension, they don't care to acknowledge perhaps the differences between a heterosexual relationship and a homosexual relationship. And I know that we've discussed this before, the differences between those relationships. Uh, right now, this is just going to be more zoomed in. It's going to be a more zoomed in discussion as opposed to a broader conversation about the whole movement, history, etc. I've got it all up here, the homophobic dissertation. I just have to put it together into a nice presentation for the wonderful audience, probably on the website, maybe during Pride Month. But yeah, I mean, if the differences aren't that significant, then the relationships and how they affect children can't be that different, right? I mean, it's just about anatomy, not even biology. They say biology, what they really mean is anatomy specifically. Then yeah, like who cares? It's all ultimately interchangeable. And most concerns conservatives would agree that the family unit is the backbone of society, okay? That's pretty good, but if you're gonna talk about family structure, then you actually have to talk about family structure. You know, we like to broadly measure that by like fathers present per capita or whatever, but this has been going on for a while. Obviously, divorce is totally normalized, getting remarried sometimes even multiple times, having step parents, step siblings, all of these things are totally normalized now. And so it really shouldn't come as a surprise to us that what is actually defining a family is becoming more subjective and experimental. But what we do know is that the farther that we get away from the nuclear family model, uh, you know, mom, dad, married with kids, the worst things get for everybody. I mean, virtually every metric for evaluating the well-being of adults and children points to this. And of course, that's not every case, but statistically, that is what we tend to see. You know, you start bringing people into these houses that aren't blood relatives. You start adding and subtracting parents like you're playing with Legos or something. Rates of abuse, mental illness, poor lifelong outcomes, et cetera. All of that goes up dramatically, which we'll get to in a second. But essentially, yeah, I'm against all of that. I'm against anything that seeks to promote or normalize the deconstruction or the disintegration of the nuclear family. Now, the reason that these particular stories are causing such a controversy and why they're leading to more discussions of surrogacy as a whole is because people are seeing these stories and they're having a very negative gut reaction to them. And like with a lot of things in America, people have been stripped of the tools to properly articulate these gut feelings and to diagnose the problems that they see right in front of them, but they still retain that understanding that, okay, something's not quite right here. And believe it or not, it's actually okay for the gut reaction to be like pretty much the core of your argument, or at least the core of what justifies your actions. And with people who don't agree, you have to wonder why they don't also have that gut reaction to these kinds of stories. Or maybe they even express a strong desire in the opposite direction. Maybe there's even something biological happening there that we'll reserve for a later time. I don't know. But regardless, your gut's going to tell you the whole story because contained in that reaction is a timeless connection to knowledge and instinct, what is good, what is not. So it really doesn't matter if modern society has paid some like really smart person to tell you why this is good, actually. And it's not good. And this is important to talk about because it seems that these trends are just going to continue. It's going to affect the future going forward because the only two issues that really matter right now are immigration and health. 
And the reason for that is very simply that civilization is going to be defined by the people in it, whether those people are your people or not your people, whether those people are doing well physically, spiritually, and mentally. Uh, and of course, these are all connected. And so in a real sense, this issue is kind of a combination of those two issues insofar as we're concerned about the well-being and stability of future generations because we're concerned about where these people are coming from, uh, which does include a conversation about family structure, which is important. And if these people are doing well, which does include a conversation about the conditions which are most conducive to people's well-being, generally speaking, almost absolutely speaking. And now I know that I'm going to be called hateful and whatever. That's fine. It's not true, but that's okay. Like I understand that's what the haters and losers were born to do. They're just going to seethe on the internet. But I say that because I know that there are people who typically enjoy the content who might find some of this offensive, be inclined to infer that my motivation behind these positions is something other than what it is. All of those reasons, by the way, are very clearly articulated here if you just watch all the way through. So to write it off is just like irrational hatred or fear or even religious fanaticism. That would just be dishonest, tempting as it may be. So we got a lot to get into, but first let's just go over what surrogacy is. For those unfamiliar, essentially it's an enforceable legal agreement that's made between a woman and another party, whether that's a person, a married couple, a gay couple, whomever, to carry a child for them, and then upon delivering that child, she will receive payments in exchange for the child. Modern surrogacy, the way it's done now, it's only a few decades old, and there are a lot of things wrong with that that probably go beyond the scope of this discussion very Frankenstein-like, treating humans like commodities. You know, slavery is one thing, like that's obviously wrong, but like it makes sense. Like I understand the idea behind capturing rival men and making them into your slaves. That's been going on forever. But literally ordering babies, like you'd order a new car, you know, you go into the interface and configure it just the way you want it. That's very new. I don't understand that. That's like, that's a man-made horror beyond my comprehension. And that's why these people love it too. They love playing God. They love that sense of power or empowerment. Speaking of empowerment, there may be a time and a place where you as an American patriot are put into a self-defense situation. Remember that time in the 1970s in New York? The power went out for like 48 hours and immediately there was rioting and looting? Of course you don't remember because you don't write the history books. Soon. The point is, if you think the likelihood of mass blackouts, food shortages, all of that, if you think that is less likely year by year, you're not going to make it. And maybe you don't live in a city, but we got pretty close in 2020 where these events started pawing at the suburbs and neighborhoods outside of the city. And of course, you've got criminal gangs coming up from Latin America who are coordinating to loot houses, kidnap people, et cetera, et cetera. And anything that you buy in preparation for a situation like that is just going to be really helpful for whoever shows up to take it from you, unless you can reliably place shots on target. It. That's what this is for. You need to get the iTarget cube today. What's great about the cubes, you place them in different spots, which is more realistic. It makes for a better training experience. Put them wherever you want. It's not like other target systems where you know it's like fixed in the same place, but it's like, oh, well, there's three targets there instead of one, and they're slightly apart from each other. Wow, thanks. Very helpful. I love when the bad guys like stand right next to each other. It's like my favorite situation to defend myself in ever. You can also practice clearing drills, sequential drills, or set it to random mode to test your skills against multiple targets. All oh, well, the system system automatically times your speed right now, not next week, right now. Save 20% off iTarget Cube, plus get free shipping with the offer code DOYLE20 at checkout. Just go to iTargetPro.com. That's the letter, iTargetPro.com. iTarget comes in most calibers, from 9mm to 223, so you can train with almost any firearm. This is the easiest, the most cost-effective way to train, and it pays for itself in a single day. This country is a tinderbox. There's no telling how crazy things might get. Don't wait. If you wait too long, these people are going to come, they're going to loot the package off your front porch, and they're going to emote on your corpse. So prepare with iTarget. That's the letter I, targetpro.com, itargetpro.com, offer code DOYLE20. Very epic. We continue. So yeah, a lot of conservatives even like this practice. They don't really see what's wrong with it because, of course, we have a lot of internalized feminism on our side. And surrogacy is, by the way, just feminism, which we will get into. Uh, but they maybe like it because they themselves want to do it for whatever reason. Maybe they can't have a child naturally. And I get that. Like, I can only imagine that sense of dread. You know, you plan to have a family. You find out that you can't naturally. You're desperate for any option that's available to you. I understand that. I mean, there are going to be people even in the audience who have had children this way, and it may touch a nerve with them, especially with the women. So I'm not saying that I don't get it, but we still have to have an honest conversation about it. So typically surrogacy involves a process called in vitro fertilization, IVF, the making of test tube babies in a lab. And in that process, only about 7% of the lives created end up being born alive. So for every 100 lives that are created, only seven about end up being born alive. And the rest die either because they don't survive the process, parents wanted specifically this gender, so they throw the rejects in the trash, et cetera. Like Paris Hilton had like 20 guys, 20 boys frozen in storage. 
because she wanted a girl. The NSYNC guy, Lance, went through like a, several dozen embryos with all of his surrogacy attempts. And this is what ends up happening. Like people want to be okay with it because they want to have a family, but it ends up just being a vehicle for celebrities and gay people who are trying to mix and match their perfect little designer families upon a mound of dead children. So in a moment of desperation, a lot of people will support this. But of course, what follows is something very sinister and abominable. Did you learn nothing from Pet Cemetery? So there are a lot of arguments to be made. Really what it boils down to, I think, is if you're trying to play around with powers that you shouldn't have access to, bad things are going to end up happening. Like the question, I suppose, is how many embryos had to be killed to bring you your child? Where is your personal line of decency with that? Like how many do you believe were justified? And how does that make you feel about your life and your family? Like ultimately that's on you. That's between you and God. I just have an obligation to speak out against what is wrong. Like don't shoot the messenger. I don't want your emails. Uh, and we'd mentioned this earlier, issues with non-nuclear family structures. And so people will say, well, what's wrong with surrogacy uh, and then not adoption? Why is one better than the other? And the answer to that is that there are cases where adoption is necessary, obviously. Cases aren't ideal, but they do happen. There are no cases where it is necessary to order a baby like he is a commission. You know, if a child is adopted, adoptive parents are there to support that child, make him feel safe and loved. With surrogacy, the parents are the ones who caused that deracination. How can they possibly understand or, or sympathize with a problem that they not only created, but planned to create and celebrate having done so? Like these kids are far more likely to have identity struggles, trauma from not having their mother, feeling as though they were commodified, uh, feelings of trauma from separation. They have like lack of medical history. They have to worry about, you know, potentially dozens of half siblings out there who they'll never meet. What happens if they end up dating their half sibling or something? These are things they have to think about. I mean, it's a very unique set of problems and circumstances, which they can't exactly talk to their parents about because they might feel guilty or ungrateful, like they're arguing against their own existence or something. Maybe the parents become immediately defensive about their decision. Like, we wonder why these kids disproportionately struggle with depression, delinquency, substance abuse. So in looking into this, I found this Twitter account that claims to document all the problems with surrogacy. And so naturally, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Let's go through this. And so then the most recent thing I see is when they're like, surrogacy exploits women's poverty and their need to support their own families. Exhibit A. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And I look at the picture and it's a woman bragging about using the money she made renting out her womb to go on a vacation to New York City with two of her kids, go on another spring break vacation with her other kids paying for soccer, dance, music lessons. Wow, yeah, very exploited. You know, these are very exploited people behaviors. I can, I clock them a mile away. I'm like a bloodhound with this stuff. I'm, I'm so sorry that happened to you, sweetheart. You must've been gaslit. You must've been manipulated. It also said she doubled her savings. You know what doubling your savings means? You know what it means when you do that, when you double your savings? It means that you had savings. People in poverty typically do not have savings. Also, poverty in America is not even a real thing. That's a discussion for a later time. We have a lower class, obviously, yes. Call it what it is, though. It's a lower class in America. That's not what we mean when we say poverty. So I saw that, and I'm like, okay, I'm sure they do good work. Anything that's putting fire downrange against surrogacy is probably good work, but I'm not interested in sob stories about how women are the real victims. I actually, I think I saw more stuff about that, about how women were the poor victims rather than stuff about the children. And yeah, I think that's probably true. So, um, you know, again, there's a lot of conversations about this and the discourse about how women are the real victims being exploited. This is the real Handmaid's Tale because, of course, conservatives are incapable of making arguments that do not appeal to some victimized outgroup. But look, like we said, with surrogacy as a whole, there are a lot of bioethical arguments. There are a lot of arguments about women. I don't really care about those arguments because I don't really care about abstractions and I don't really care about women other than the ones I just saw at Thanksgiving. But I do care that these children have no one to speak up for them and they would certainly never want to be deprived of their mothers and treated as property, much less uh, go into the hands of men who have histories of perverted behavior. Yeah, all surrogacy is bad. This is especially bad. So if we can use this discussion to make people realize that surrogacy is bad, maybe make the anti-surrogacy people realize that this is even worse, we can call it a day, we can get out of here. We have to stop viewing surrogate women as victims. We also have to stop shying away from the fact that yes, it's actually worse when two men do it. Well, it has nothing to do with homosexuality. It's about exploiting women. Thank you. The anti-surrogacy discussion, like all of right-wing discourse, is filled with very weak arguments that have to appeal to these liberal tendencies by saying things like, well, it exploits impoverished women. This is just like Handmaid's Tale. And we do this because we're unconfident in our own positions, because we're cowards. Because we're cowards, we, 
similarly to women themselves, refuse to hold women accountable for their own behavior and call a spade a spade. And I understand, like, there are horror stories. I sympathize with that. But the types of women who would rent out their wombs tend to have genetics that would suggest they'd be more than capable of earning a living in another way, or they could just actually get married and raise their own children. Like, when we talk about why we always lose because we're cowards, this is the quintessential example of that. You can't oppose something because it's bad, only because it's really bad for this group of poor victimized people. The thing in itself is only bad and therefore worth pushing back against because it's mean to a group of people and that is bad. People are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to sell this messaging to disaffected white guys in Wisconsin. Who is this for? It's like if your waiter got your order wrong, they bring you like a cheeseburger instead of an omelet and instead of just saying, hey, yeah, I didn't, I didn't order a cheeseburger. I ordered a Western omelet. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. But instead of just saying that, you're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, excuse me, hi, ah, uh, I'm like allergic to cheeseburgers. Can I just get like two eggs, please? And like, just say what needs to, to happen, you know? And maybe it's like a tactical decision. Ooh, big brain. We're going to use ground that we've already lost to maybe secure a victory in the future, appeal to an incumbent framework, even if it's something that we don't like, even if it's not ours. The thing with that, though, I never see these people rotate back to push farther. So it seems that they actually agree with the leftist premises in themselves, but they just think that perhaps they've been taken too far as opposed to their natural and intended conclusions. Well, well just because something's natural doesn't mean it's good. Erm, um, appeal to nature fallacy. You know what's funny about that? I noticed the further away we get from things that are natural, the more overwhelmed we are with very bad results, such as these situations. Can you imagine supporting this? Can you imagine not pushing back against this? Imagine tearing a newborn baby away from his mother. They don't even do that with puppies. The only person in the world who that baby is familiar with, he's literally crying out, craving her touch and the sound of her voice and her warmth and her smell. And she's what, in another room bleeding by herself, refreshing her bank balance so that you can play advanced house. You're causing irreparable psychological damage, which has been proven time and time again to this child because you want to play advanced house. A child whom you claim to love and care for. What a joke, dude. Why is this allowed? The way I see it and the way the founding fathers saw it is that our rights come from God. There's no right to a child. Children aren't entitlements. They're blessings. You're not owed a child. You don't have the right to order and purchase a child. And if your rights come from nature, well, this whole process was invented to circumvent what is actually natural. And if you mean that in like a Midas right sense, don't have to... <laughs> Don't have to sell me on that one. That's fine. We're just going to become mightier than you and make it illegal and you're going to go to prison. But it's true because if you have a right to a child, that means human beings are not human beings. How do you have rights to somebody who also has rights? And I, I wouldn't go as far as to say it makes human beings property because, you know, they wouldn't support something like slavery unless it was us being enslaved. They really, I think, only care about their power and making their enemies miserable. Simple as that. Like, that's how they view existence. Everything exists for their pleasure Enemies are people who impede in any capacity their pleasure, even with virtue signaling. Like that's ultimately just using the alleged suffering of other groups of people to pleasure themselves by publicly expressing their altruism. It makes them feel good. Surrogacy in general is wrong and it's selfish. Infertility is not a death sentence. I mean, a lot of times, especially nowadays, it's related to your lifestyle with all the chemicals in our food, in our water, our clothing, etc. Hold on. Did I just say chemicals in the clothing? Okay, gamers. Imagine for a moment if you could turn the world's most comfortable boxer brand into a crew neck sweatshirt, a hoodie, something of that nature. It's time. I love these guys. The owner writes me letters. Why don't you do that? One argument at a time. You've already got a drawer full of Undertack boxers because you followed my instructions, which is why you're still alive. What's next? I love that you thought that. We get along so well, you and I. I want to know how to cover the entire surface area of my body in this material. Boom, we've got wool socks, which are five times stronger than your typical high quality merino wool. These things will last you a lifetime. Wear them with your boots, you're going skiing, whatever. You're not wearing these things out. Plus, they retain all the properties that you want. Moisture wicking, antibacterial, reinforced toe, breathable in the summer, insulated in the winter. I'd show you the ones I have on right now. I don't want my feet being posted on strange websites though, okay? Only on our website, right boys? But it's the same with the hoodies, the joggers, crewnecks, good design, it's low key. We're not trying to LARP as some operator, ooh, but we have the high quality material. It tends to fit better than these other companies that just use like pre-made clothing and then they just kind of like stamp their logo on it. And if that's not enough, they donate a portion of their profits to organizations actively in the fight against human trafficking. 
definition pending. I'm trying to get them to include cases like we're discussing here as a part of that. But in the meantime, you have to support this American company with the most comfortable men's basics on the planet, undertack.com. That's undertack.com, 20% off site-wide. When you use my offer code, DOYLE20, you have nothing to lose because it comes with a satisfaction guarantee. Think about that. Guaranteed satisfaction. Where else are you going to get that? Nowhere. Nowhere else. Everyone else who says that is lying to you. Pick up a hoodie, joggers, socks, and of course, more boxers for yourself or someone who is in dire need. Undertack.com. That's undertack.com. Offer code DOYLE20. Very epic. We continue. Ultimately, it has to be considered why your desire to raise a child outweighs the child's right to his mother. Will these people consider that? Probably not. But we will have to consider that when thinking about what is to be done with this issue. Adoption's one thing, but surrogacy, like made-to-order creation of new life, that's selfish. That's wrong. An adoption in itself isn't supposed to be like babysitting or caretaking. Like, all right, yeah, we'll take it from here. Food, water, shelter, clothing, right? And it's like, okay, got it. No, it's understood as the best case scenario for the child given the circumstances, which is to have a positive male and female presence in the child's life. It's not just about like adult supervision. Okay, yeah, two moms, two dads, they, them, who cares? Just feed it. Well, you know, studies show they're actually uh, just as well off as children raised in nuclear households. Yeah, they might be well adjusted in the sense that they keep their nose clean, do relatively well in school, pursue higher education, etc. When you start to examine the less superficial metrics, things that really implicate the overall quality of life, sense of being, not so much. And again, it's really not complicated. The only question that matters is, is this good for society? No other question ultimately matters. Is it popular to want to get rid of this? No. We haven't held power in opinion curating institutions in a long time, so nothing we believe is popular. <laughs> wah, wah, you know, but it's still important. Is it politically correct? Same answer. No, not really. The good news is that public opinion really doesn't matter. So we can't let that dissuade us. If we're organized enough, we can do whatever we want, but still. For the ecosystem which has spent billions of dollars talking about the family, you would think they would take a little bit more issue with this. You weaken marriage by liberalizing divorce laws. Now you want to liberalize marriage laws so that anyone can get married. And you expect this to like work out for you? You expect to conserve something? You know, well, no, because they're controlled opposition. But I did see this case recently where a woman who was a surrogate was diagnosed with breast cancer 25 weeks into the pregnancy. And so to get chemotherapy, she wanted to deliver the child prematurely so that everyone could have a chance to survive. And the two men who hired her didn't like this idea because they didn't want to deal with the health complications that may occur with a premature delivery, since typically babies are, you know, like an accessory to these kinds of people. And I get it. You know, I had my Ridgeback from show dogs, but he's also a dog. Not someone I'm going to claim to love or be a father to. Well, no, nah, I love He's a good boy. But anyways, it, you know, it's like you order prints. They don't come out right. So you're like, eh, I don't want it. Except it's a living person. So they said, no, we're not paying for a baby born before 38 weeks because of potential health issues. So you have to immediately terminate the pregnancy. She said, no, I don't want to do that. I'll just adopt him. Or if not me, I have an uncle who says that he'll adopt him. And then the guys were like, no, actually, we're going to demand a death certificate now. And so they're threatening legal action. The courts in California get involved to save the day. <sighs> That was close. And then the court says that while they can't force her to terminate the pregnancy, they can, at the request of the two men, force her to have life-saving care denied to the baby after he's delivered justice. So that's exactly what happened. The boy died on the table. The woman, whose name I believe is Brittany, said that the whole experience made her feel like a rented-out uterus. I don't know what she expected, but yeah, that's exactly what you were, uh, and it cost a life. So from the moment of your child's conception, he was a commodity. Did you try to take good care of the commodity? Sure. What, do we clap? Are we supposed to celebrate that? Now, a normal country would think, wow, if they were so ready to discard that baby boy, maybe that's indicative that they have no right to purchase children. I mean, they sound like terrible parents. Then again, though, a normal country probably wouldn't allow for purchasing children in the first place, so I guess we kind of get what we deserve there. So yeah, I don't know what happened to those guys. They probably just got another surrogate. A normal country would also look at somebody like Shane Dawson, who has a history of saying that six-year-olds are sexy, pretending to jerk off to pictures of 11-year-olds, attempting to defend being attracted to children is just a fact. Fetish, admitting to having Googled child content. Uh, he's talked about having sex with his cat. It's called Naked Baby Sexy. He's admitted that he was molested as a child. We would maybe look at that and say, okay, if anybody should not be able to purchase a child, but now he's got a pair of twin boys from a surrogate. Why do the gay guys always get little boys? Why is it never little girls? Someone should look into that. It seems unfair. It's, it's unegalitarian. And for the record, I'm not suggesting anything about this guy. I'm just saying there's a lot of boxes that are checked off here, like a comical like a comical amount of boxes. 
They also created 10 other human lives and just flushed them down the toilet, by the way. Great parents, because I guess they weren't optimal. And then they vlogged about it. Like, wow, how do I make murdering children like about me? How do I make content from this? Like this is, this is, then they're taking photos with the baby where it's meant to simulate breastfeeding. They're posing in the bed, acting as though they just delivered these children the same way that Pete Buttigieg did when he got the babies. These are red flags. You'd think it should be more difficult to purchase a human child than a firearm in this country. I say some silly things on the internet. Now I have to wait three days or just get totally denied from purchasing a firearm. These guys say things like this, do things like this. You just walk right through the door, do something which nobody ever would have thought would have been considered normal practice, let alone some kind of right or entitlement, which is purchasing human children to play advanced house. Human trafficking is perfectly legal, as long as you're a homosexual and you live in a Western country. Like you look up the definition of human trafficking, it describes this, except it prefaces it with the unlawful act of blah, blah, blah. The only difference between the act and the unlawful act, is those words. Like one is lawful, one is not. It's words on paper. Intrinsically, it's all the same. What is occurring is all the same. Now, if I were a robot, if I'm a pattern detecting entity, and I looked at this story with a guy who's got a history of making comments like this in a type of relationship which has a disproportionate pattern with certain behaviors like this, I might reach some conclusions which aren't very nice. And then laying in the bed too, acting like he delivered the baby, it's such a crude mockery. You think that's a crude mockery? Wait till I tell you what they're trying to imply produced that baby. You ever see an exit only sign? Probably there for a pretty good reason, right? Well, some people like to ignore very obvious rules, usually because they didn't have good parents. But the reason that they do those photo shoots is because they get off to it. They enjoy subverting and mocking what is natural. They think it's naughty. They like the pride. They enjoy the mockery of it. And the children validate the relationship. If they wanted to be parents, then they could just go and be parents. But the baby acts as an accessory to what they actually want, their true priority, which is to identify and behave in the ways that they do. So that's why they have to do the whole wholesome chungus gay couple in a bed LARP. People have fetishes for pretending to be animals. You think they wouldn't have a fetish for subverting the institution of marriage? Of course they do. Imagine taking any of these people at their word. Why would you trust that? Why would you trust, well, they'll take it this far, but then they'll stop. They won't take it any further. We just want to step up and look after these poor foster kids. Give them a home. Oh, okay, sounds fair enough to me. Look at where that's trending now. And they, they even get preference, actually, when adopting because technically speaking, they're infertile. And then that is trending towards gay guys suing to have their surrogates covered by the American taxpayer since technically speaking, they're infertile. And so to not give them that would be discrimination since infertility is defined as unprotected sex for 12 months uh, with no conception. And yeah, no one wants to have an, a couple uncomfortable conversations. I truly struggle to think of something more disgustingly selfish than this, and I hate that word in politics. Oh, it's disgusting. It's very feminine. But I mean that sincerely. The level of selfishness on display here does evoke a disgust response at minimum. It actually makes me angry. It's very offensive. And again, we're going to go through all of this in definitive levels of detail in the future. But what's more is that we've actually seen data from countries that have had same-sex marriage since the beginning of this century. And something like 96% of gay people didn't even care to get married. And before that, no one was stopping gay couples from getting married in private ceremonies. No one was stopping gay couples from doing what they do in the privacy of their own home, like we were told. So what you learn when you actually study the real history of the gay rights movement which can we all agree, by the way, like that's how we got to where we are in terms of the LGBT stuff, right? We know that. That's not my opinion. That's just knowledge. But what you learn when you study the actual history of that movement is that it was never about privacy or any of the other bumper sticker platitudes that you hear about. It's all the same. It's about normalization and validation, promotion and enforcement, ultimately. Why do they want to get married if they don't tend to be interested in marriage at all, let alone staying married or in virtually no cases even staying committed to each other? Why do they want to adopt children? Why do they want to order children? Normalization and validation. Children are treated as trophies to validate those relationships, to subvert the standards of the nuclear family, which they hate in so many cases because it failed to protect them, and so they resent it. So the bottom line is that if you do this, you're depriving your child of the right to his mother and to be made out of love. Like, what kind of a foundation is that? Cowards want to avoid the extent of this. Well, it has nothing to do with gay people. It's about surrogacy. I generally agree but I think you're being a bit dishonest. I think we're not trying to make America great again right now because does that mean that you're against surrogacy, but you're totally fine with a gay couple adopting a child? Really? Even when they're given preference for being technically infertile? Look, I agree. All surrogacy is bad, but can we acknowledge there's a difference here? Can we be adults? Or are you saying that love is love and it doesn't matter if it's a straight couple or a gay couple? It's all the same, right? There's no differences. Love is love. Here's the truth that people don't want to touch. Gay couples will never be able to meet the standard of straight couples. It's impossible. There might be overlap in some cases, 
But for the most part, it's entirely separate. It's a totally different category. With two men adopting a child, how can you provide an example of femininity if you're not a woman? I mean, not that they adopt little girls, uh, but you know what I mean. Like, or if you're a man, I mean, how can you provide an example of a masculine identity if you yourself don't have one? Now, this is where it gets tricky. You might be a man in the sense that you take fitness very seriously, you excel in your career, you do well for yourself. A lot of gay men check these boxes, especially the ones who make a lot of money to then spend on children. But what actually causes them to be gay? What causes homosexuality? They've never found a gene for it, crazy enough. What it actually is, it's always an artificial disruption in a young boy's natural development into his masculine identity. There's psychological literature on this that has been censored and shelved away like the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it exists and it was never disproven. It was declared offensive basically by activists infiltrating the American Psychological Association, many of whom were openly homosexual, to do precisely this, which they now brag about using your tax dollars 50 years later. And we'll elaborate on this in the aforementioned dissertation, I will feed you baby birds, do not worry, but it's not genetic. There are some biological factors that can make you predisposed towards manifesting homosexual attraction and behavior, such as your prenatal hormone exposure, but ultimately, it will not manifest without some sort of environmental influence. And so, you've now given this child a permanent identity crisis. You, you can never love that child. I mean, you love that child insofar as he makes you feel like a parent, but love is sacrificial. And if you truly love that child, you would not have rented his mother's womb and then taken the child away from her so that you can be a father. You're not actually a father. I don't know what you are. I don't know that I care enough to figure it out, but I know you're not a father. You should have sacrificed your desire for the child, but it was the other way around. So you're not a father, and I know that you know that because a father's first and deepest instinct is to protect his kids and to facilitate their well-being. And from the moment of that child's conception, you not only ignored that, you did the exact opposite, all in service of yourself. This child was not conceived out of love, let alone marriage or something natural. You commissioned his conception out of selfishness and perversion. Literally, from the moment the life was created, it was never about the well-being of the child, only about your desires, which apparently are worth the price of depriving that child of a mother's love and warmth. You commissioned a life for the purpose of robbing him of that. That's the first thing to happen to this child. It was your plan for that to happen. Well, how is this even different from biological parents? I mean, it's all, you know it. Stop being a materialist. Stop being a dork. You know, this is spiritual. This transcends our comprehension of existence. Every child has a right to their mother and to their father, but especially to their mother. Dads have been ditching kids since the beginning of time. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying the idea of a child being sold to two men and being deprived of his mother, maybe his mother volunteered to sell him, like that is yet again a whole new level of man-made horror beyond my comprehension. We've got this weird belief that we're like entitled to live any life we want to live by simulation. I'm entitled to have blonde hair, so I dye it. I'm entitled to have big boobs, so I get plastic surgery. But if you can't become a parent naturally, then the question becomes, are you equally likely as, say, a typical couple to parent this child successfully? If not, are you more likely to do it competently or incompetently? What if your likelihood to manifest problematic behaviors is significantly greater? Ignoring even that, what if there's virtually no chance that your child will develop normally and will always be longing to have his mother and his father present? Children who grow up in these households have a 25% chance of being at some point forced to have sex against their will, a 25% chance of contracting an STI, which matches suspiciously well with the previous figure. There's a 29% chance that they'll end up identifying as LGBT, 24% chance that they'll be suicidal. They're significantly more likely to experience depression and trouble with future relationships. And again, this is obviously true. And you see similar, though less significant trends with step parents, adopted parents. The further you get away from the nuclear family, the more problems arise, obviously. And we've discussed before the problem with what is referred to as gay marriage, not even like the arguments against it, but I mean like the dynamics of these relationships, the rates of being open relationships, the number of sex partners on average, the length of time that these things even last on average. If the average American, here's what I'll say, if the average American knew what goes on, they would be like, what the heck? <laughs> Wait a minute, buddy, hold on, what? That's why they had to make their slogan literally equality, saying love is love. We're just kind of silly. It's equal, it's the same, it's a little bit silly. That's why the well-put-together couples are actually more subversive. The ones who present themselves well, the quiet gay couple in the Vineyard Vines pullover, they're just so nice. They're just, they're just a little bit silly. People's entire perception is informed by what they see on television. The image of the well-put-together gay couple, it's actually more subversive than the outright degenerate gay people because it convinces normal people Oh, you know, I guess it is pretty much the same. <laughs> Accepting these things, getting to where we are now, that didn't happen because of pride parades. It happened because of the media pushing the image of the clean-cut gay guy. 
Now people think there's no overlap, and then they get confused when they see people getting canceled for saying, well, hey, we probably shouldn't have furry BDSM demonstrations at family-friendly pride events. And they wrote about this, too, in their activist manifestos, how they could take advantage of the straight male tendency to want to protect, the straight female tendency to want to empathize with, and use it to forward their agenda, which in conclusion means that if you disagree with anything that I've said, it's because you've fallen victim to gay propaganda. But it's true. I mean, according to, what is it, the American College of Pediatricians, homosexual couples provide a far less stable and safe environment for children. They've noted that the violence among homosexual partners is two to three times more common than among married heterosexual couples. And homosexual partnerships are significantly more prone to disillusion than heterosexual marriages, with the average homosexual partnership only lasting something like two to three years. They're also far more likely than heterosexuals to experience a mental illness, substance abuse, suicidal tendencies, shortened lifespans, uh, and basically they've concluded that given the current body of research, it's inappropriate and potentially hazardous to children and dangerously irresponsible to change the age-old prohibition on homosexual parenting, whether by adoption, foster care, reproductive manipulation, uh, and this position is rooted in the best available science. Does that sound like a good environment for children? So we have to protect the needs of children over the desires of adults, in conclusion. Uh, let alone adults who have no business raising a child. Well, how can you be pro-life and anti-surrogacy? Well, it's not about you. It's, it's about giving life to the babies. Yeah, I'm pro-life because pro-life is just good marketing for not wanting babies to die. It does not literally mean I just want there to be infinite people in the world, and much less to have them made to order and stripped away from their birthright. The issue of surrogacy has little to do with life, actually. It's counterintuitive, but you think that, and then you go, okay, well, how can the left support abortion, which is about killing babies, and then also support surrogacy, which is about creating babies? It doesn't really make sense. And yeah, I mean, ignoring how many typically die in the process of surrogacy, like we mentioned earlier, what matters to them isn't so much life. It's being able to do whatever they want. It's playing God. It's total feminist domination. And frankly, there's a lot of really stupid sentiment on the right that's just completely separated from reality. And the worst part of it is that included in the tenets of it, are that if you don't agree, you're the brainwashed one. You're paid off by the World Economic Forum. And a lot of it is just this really low IQ conspiracy theory stuff about the globalists being anti-human. Because if it's an anti-human thing, then we can all team up and unite against them. No exclusion necessary, so long as you're not evil. If you're a human, you can be on the team as well. If it's an anti-human thing, then it's evil and satanic and we have to unite together, you know, like, like in a movie. I don't think it's an anti-human thing. It's more that they're anti-nature or even post-human. They hate excellence and they hate virtue. They hate childbirth, not because it creates life, but because it's natural and because it's beautiful. If they were anti-human, they would hate surrogacy, but they don't. They love it because it's unnatural. It seeks to conquer nature. I'll put it this way. What have these anti-human people worked harder for in the last few decades? Preventing nice, wholesome, quiet communities from forming or preventing crowded slums from forming? If I were anti-human, I would probably crack down on the one with the most people. But maybe it's not about people. It's almost an egalitarian word, isn't it, right? People, it puts us all equal, right? When I say I'm pro-human, I mean that to say I am in favor of human flourishing and beauty and excellence and accomplishment. If they're anti-human, it's because they are opposed to that. But if it were just defined as like literally millions of blob people just all existing somewhere, some ugly, disgusting communist city, some 15-minute city or whatever, they would love that. They would get off to that. Or they'll say, well, they're not only anti-human, they're eugenicists. What anti-human eugenicists Eugenics, I don't know anything about that. What do I look like to you, some ancient Greek philosopher? Look, we should be careful with that word, eugenics, but you know what the other side of that coin is that we should really pay some more attention to since it's just running buck wild right now? Dysgenics, artificially subsidizing people who otherwise would not have lots of children into having lots of children. Transferring wealth away from the productive and generally polite and law-abiding members of society to people who are the complete opposite of that so that they can have seven or eight kids. What do you think the ripple effect of that is gonna look like? When you've got a society that is structured to disincentivize, to make low status to make unattractive starting families and having children, but only to a certain part of the population. To the rest, well, we're actually going to take money from those people. We're going to give it to you guys to breed like rabbits. And we've got open borders so we can do the same for illegal aliens. What happens in that scenario? Fast forward 20 years. What does that country look like? We shouldn't artificially control for characteristics in people. Hey, I'm not saying that we should, but we are. Literally as a matter of policy, we are just in the opposite direction. It is evolving, but backwards. So somebody's doing it. It's not like neutral. It's just going in the opposite direction from what you think. 
Maybe we should start talking about that. You want to know why people aren't having kids? Because anytime you go somewhere in public, it's like you can't even recognize it. You go to the airport, you go to a shopping mall, you go to an amusement park, you go downtown to have dinner, watch a show, any place in the country where people are gathered, there are too many people and it sucks. It throws off the vibe. Why aren't people having kids? Yeah, the economy's bad. People have always had families, though, throughout history, even throughout circumstances that are far worse than what we have now, unbelievably worse than what we have now. Okay, uh, I've got one. What are the fertility rates looking like for people living under occupation? Are they rushing to have children? Are they rushing to start families? What's the line? Noble creatures refuse to breed in captivity. Maybe there's something to be said about that. Is that the whole problem? No, wouldn't claim that it is. But it's certainly something something that's being omitted from the current discourse surrounding the issue. And do I even trust that people will realize this consciously? Maybe, but like we said, the tools to articulate the feelings surrounding what they're experiencing in this country have, for the most part, been stripped away from them. So instead, they might say, well, it's because of the economy. Well, I'm just not ready, whatever reason. But those experiences do have effects on people. There's no way that they don't. You go out and you feel like a stranger in your own country, like an alien. That doesn't exactly make you excited to make moves that would dig your roots deeper into conquered territory. And this just continues because our government just keeps importing millions of people every year. So there's no natural rebalancing. I would almost prefer that, honestly. There's fewer people, but at least they're Americans. You know, like 50 years ago when our country's population was about half of what it is now. Wow, what a terrible place to live. <sighs> Must have been real bland, a real ghost town. Certainly not the height of Western civilization, which produces a nostalgia that every American resonates with and that every conservative movement tries to capture in some form, even if they just ultimately betray the people who it resonates with in the first place. Yeah, you can have enrichment, or you can have lower home prices and less traffic. Okay, yeah, I'll take the second one, please. But what solutions are we offered? Even from the based in trad right, uh, I'm seeing a lot of 32-year-old women telling the boys that they just need to man up and put a baby in me. I know I went through a phase, okay? I just, I didn't know any better. I was taken advantage of by degenerate men. But now, I'm, I'm, I'm saved by the grace of Christ and I'm ready to settle down with a good man who doesn't smoke or drink or play video games or gamble. That all, by the way, just means you can't hang out with your friends. I don't know if you've learned that lesson yet, but that's what that means. You get to stay at home with her and cuddle. And he wants to marry me. Wow, that sounds really great. I'm really, I'm so happy for you. God bless you. And then you just slowly back away. It's like you're spelunking. You find an old stick of dynamite or something. You just slowly back away. It's going to take a little bit more than that. The answer to restoring families is not just telling people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You have to understand the psychology of the average person. That's what we're working with. That's what we're looking to correct. And we have to be very specific with what the word family means, because otherwise you've got guys working for conservative media outlets talking about my personal news. Bro, that is not your child. Hell yeah, brother. That's pro-humanity. Two strong conservative fathers in a conservative household that will vote Republican. You know, there have been several cases of these people now working for conservative media companies, right-wing media companies, organizations, whatever. And then there's God knows how many of these stories happening behind the scenes because these companies employ lots of these types of people who aren't necessarily public figures. They just work behind the scenes in different capacities. Uh, so I just want to spell out very clearly what that means and why this is so sinister. When this happens, you as a right-wing media company are facilitating a transfer of dollars from your audience, who is ostensibly well-meaning, Christian, patriotic audience. You're facilitating a transfer of dollars from their pockets into the pockets of men who purchase children. That's what that is. That's what's actually taking place. The money that they spend in purchasing those children and taking them away from their mothers, those dollars were earned by hardworking, normal, likely Christian American families. And then they gave you those dollars. They gave that to your company because they like the work you're doing. They like to think that you're representing their voice. And you take those dollars, you skim a little off the top for yourself, and you give the rest to an open homosexual who takes those dollars and rents out a woman's womb and keeps the child for himself and another man. That's actually what's happening here. It's actually worse than surrogacy in itself because it's surrogacy that was paid for by the labor of well-meaning American patriots. You're the middleman. Money was taken out of their households, and it was put into a household that would take children away from other households or plan to, or use their platform to promote and normalize a lifestyle, which quite often includes that. Like, that is what is happening here. That's why it's so repulsive, because these companies are behaving in a way that is a complete betrayal of people who support them. And then they celebrate the announcement. What a slap in the face. Moreover, what do you think the cost-benefit looks like with having these LGBT conservative influencers? Who's winning right now? How many LGBT people were really just not getting it 
And then they saw a gay guy say that like a flat tax is probably a good idea. Until a gay person gave them permission to like what, vote Republican? People that will only vote for us if we expressly validate their identities, these are the people we want, these are the real movers and shakers. Take that versus what it does to normalize these identities and these behaviors and these lifestyles on the right. If you could quantify that, how many people do you think woke up on the issues because of one of these characters versus people on our side being hypnotized into thinking, well, I guess it doesn't really matter because they see so many of these people who, yeah, they vote Republican. And the worst part, honestly, they're not even good on the issues. If it were like, okay, look, the guy is intelligent. He's good on the issues. He just happens to be, you know, what are you going to do? Pray for the guy. That would be one thing. But they're all neocons. They're all conservatarians. They're all liberals who are just like vaguely annoyed with leftism, not even annoyed with anything left wing. It's like when you wanted, you know, pepper at a restaurant and then it's like, okay, well, that's too much pepper. You're like, well, I didn't want that much pepper. So I don't really care for this amount of it. They suck on the issues. It's the same ideas for the last 20 years. And then when they repackage that into their version of it, they just repeat that for the last however many years. It sucks, but it makes people feel less mean. Ha! Bet you won't call me a bigot now. Really, I would rather, honestly, I would rather just win. I don't really care what communists think of me. I don't know why you do, but great. Okay, we're attracting people who suck on the issues. I'm sure that'll help us finally become a serious movement, an organized movement with a serious volume of discourse surrounding it. Where's the appeal? Who's winning right now? We are such losers. You wanna know how bad it is? We have lost so much ground that we can't even conserve the quality of our gay conservatives anymore. Remember Milo Yiannopoulos? Good on the issues, legitimately intelligent guy, very well-spoken, talented writer and presenter, gave a college speaking tour with a title that I don't even think I can say the name of. Now we got a bunch of idiots. They're promoted because it's strategic because of our big tent coalition. Look, I get it. I'm all for the big tent. I love the big tent, but I love it because it attracts more of our people, not stragglers from other tents who want to make a quick buck. There's several million of them. These types of people being promoted to the head of what we're trying to accomplish here does far more to normalize their behavior than it does to recruit. I've met a lot of these people. They're very nice people, but we're not here to make friends. We are here to achieve the win conditions. And those do not include the normalization of what was unthinkable to promote as recently as just a few years ago. If you wanna live those lifestyles, ultimately, that's your decision. But what tends to happen is that we find out there's really no such thing as the private individual acting in the privacy of their own home because wherever these people tend to get involved, whether it's education, media, politics, they can't seem to help themselves but make everything uh, a little different. So do you want things to be normal again or do you want to be called mean? That's literally the only question that Americans need to ask themselves. The truth is mean. It's harsh. It's not ideal. And the truth about surrogacy is that it's just the logical conclusion of feminism. It's the complete and total and ultimate empowerment of women. We've discussed the differences between men and women and our understandings of those, so allow me to tie that now into a nice bow here to conclude. Let's go over how down bad the boys are right now. If a woman's only agency is really her sexuality, then why does that stop at having children? Women have been using sex, when I say sex, I mean that very broadly, you know, because uh, as we'll discuss, it's all a scale. It just depends on where they want to personally draw the line, but they all do it, you know, their beauty, their vivaciousness, sometimes even sex itself, all of that has been used by women to benefit themselves since there have been women. I'm not mad about that. That's just what it is. So the reason that feminists hate children and childbearing isn't because of what they represent in themselves. Maybe there is a component to it that they hate because it recalls the natural order, but it's because of the responsibility that those things impose upon women. If a woman's only agency is her sexuality, why would she draw the line at having children so long as she's not responsible for them? What's incoherent about female empowerment and then selling your own child for money? Sounds pretty powerful to me. Being able to create a life for the purpose of selling it or just killing it, that's a lot of power. Of course, it's evil, but it's power. That's why so much of what is classified as empowerment we view to be exploitative and debased. Do they care? Probably not. Are they still miserable? Probably. Will they correct course? You see, I mean, we can't trust all of our narrators to be as reliable as us, gentlemen, especially you know, if you don't have an internal monologue in a lot of cases. These are just the questions. I don't know. Um, I said this at an event recently. I swear to God, I had a woman come up to me afterwards. There were a dozen guys watching who can confirm this. She was angry with me because I stated the fact that women will dress in certain ways to accentuate certain features because it makes them more attractive to men. And even if they say they do it for themselves or for other women, it's ridiculous because the only reason attractiveness is a relevant concept is because we're sexual beings. They feel more confident because they know men find them more attractive and they can feel more attractive than other women, et cetera. So I said this, she comes up to me, she's all angry. She unzips 
her hoodie and takes it off. She's wearing leggings and a very low cut tank top. I swear to God, she's like, what about this is sexualized? I was, I was like, are you, do you, are you gonna make me say it? Like, is this actually? And again, I'm not mad about this. These are just the way things are. Women objectify themselves every day. It's just a question for them on where they wanna draw the line. They dress a certain way, they wear a certain style of makeup, they take endless photos of themselves, but then they'll get angry with other women for being immodest because her attempts to draw attention to herself and to her beauty and to her features are like what? Too obvious, something like that, maybe 10% more extreme, 20% more extreme, whoa, easy. It's the same behavior, just at different scales. It's like a guy selling lemonade. You know, he's mad at the guy across the street for selling lemonade at a lower price. It's like, guys are both selling lemonade. I don't know, what do you want from me? So I'm just being honest here. And again, you, can, can, you can't really get mad, you know? It's like, this is just women, all right? If you're getting mad at them, you've already lost. It's a skill issue. Well, no, John, you don't get it. These poor women, they've been brainwashed into thinking this is good for them. Are we sure? Are we sure about that? We're ignoring that there are at least two premises within that which are completely irrational. Let us consider the alternative hypothesis, which has held true for thousands of years, which is that the only thing that can really cultivate what we would regard to be modesty in women is a patriarchal, religious, and especially Christian society. When that goes away, things are always gonna tend to head in this direction. And I'm not counter-signaling modesty, by the way. I'm not counter-signaling traditional sexual morality. I'm just observing that the reason that so much of the discourse surrounding these things is off the mark is because it's being led by women who are perfectly happy to participate in these types of things and they find God, they make a Twitter account in their 30s, and then they shame the more attractive younger women for doing the same thing that they themselves were happy to do back then. And then I'm the villain for accurately describing their behavior. It's crazy. And people are going to get mad about this one. So be it. This was a big red pill for me. Do you ever think about why prostitution is still illegal? Is that just like the one hill that we're really good at holding for some reason? Hey, I mean, good for us. You know, I don't want to lose that hill. But of all the things that they're pushing on young men, marijuana, pornography, hedonism, displacement, sedation, humiliation, why have they not moved in on prostitution? Isn't that weird? Like, do we actually have some political power? We're just focusing all of it on that? Is there some secret lobby in Vegas working to preserve their monopoly on it? No, it's not the Vegas monopoly. It's because it preserves the female monopoly on sexual access. No, John, it's about human trafficking and STIs and evil. You really buy that? You believe that our government, which does the things that it does and enables the things that it enables and promotes the things that it promotes, you think that it simply decided to just do the right thing when it comes to prostitution? They got that one thing right? The reason prostitution is illegal, even though the left thinks it's empowering and they celebrate it, the reason that power in this country hasn't caught up to that and why it's illegal is because of feminism. It's because it preserves the female monopoly on sex and it gives them even more power over men. Think about it. Go back a couple generations. Women weren't making money. Women had all these pressures put on them from their families and from their communities to get married young, whereas men were making money. They had pressure on them to get married too, sure, but not nearly like the pressures put on young women. It was a lot easier for men average men, young men, to find a wife, to find a woman. And a lot of that was motivated by the male sexual impulse. Men have always been horny. So the question is, where is that impulse being channeled? Is it being channeled into something good, something productive? Or is it just being wasted, just flushed down the drain because of screen whores? If men could go pay a hundred bucks and have sex with a hooker, I mean, that's disgusting. You don't know where that's been, how many diseases she has, what's going on there. But at least that's a real experience. At least you're in control of that situation. You have the power in that situation. Doesn't make it right, does not make that a good idea, but at least you're in control of that. Maybe you're a slave to your desires to get yourself into a situation like that. You probably have to be. But if you're already a slave to your desires, What's gonna keep you in those shackles? Is it being assaulted 24 hours a day by pornography and e-girls putting women on this pedestal? Or is it going to have sex with a hooker and being like, eh, that's the problem. We've elevated women to such a pedestal in our everyday lives. Men are debasing themselves for women. And I love women, I cherish women. Nobody has more respect for women than me. But in order to create a society that we want to live in, something approximating what we used to have in this country, men have to realize themselves. And they will never do that if they're being tugged along on a leash all day because of women. Because what do men do now for women? They debase themselves. They adopt viewpoints that aren't even theirs. They allow women to do whatever they want, to speak to them however they will. They're completely whipped, completely domesticated. They don't see their friends. They give up on their dreams, on their mission. Do you understand how many men adjust their everyday existence based upon access to women? It's weak behavior, and it's maintained by the female monopoly on sexual access. That keeps men domesticated and docile, which is why our society has degraded into what it has, because women have all the power. That doesn't mean they'll be happy. doesn't mean they'll even use it properly or understand that they have it, but they have it. 
And if men could just go pay a hundred bucks and get a hooker, that psychology would change. And I'm not saying any of this is good, by the way, but the male sexual impulse is real. It's going to go somewhere. And there's a reason that they're distracting you with a constant assault of screen whores, making consent contracts, putting you on dating apps where you have to beg for a message back. It's created a society of good little boys. Good little boys are boys who give their balls to women. And I'm not making an argument in favor of this. I'm simply telling you why it makes perfect sense that with all of the evil things that exist in our society, this is the one thing that's not being promoted. It would be confusing to me if I didn't understand this because I would think, wait a minute, why are they promoting all of this sexual degeneracy, but they're still arresting people for prostitution? That's so weird. It's not weird. What is more empowering for women than getting paid to have sex with you? Getting paid not even to have sex with you, but for you to like, what, jerk off to them by yourself in your room? It's weak behavior. And don't worry, I'm consistent across the board as well. When me and my cool friends take power, we're gonna arrest these people too. But it will be because we're restoring a male-dominated society instead of a female-dominated one. Female-dominated societies will put pornography on every screen and magazine in the country, but will arrest you and have you fined and fired for making the wrong comment about it. Stop objectifying us! That's why we've got surrogacy too. What could be more empowering for women than selling your baby? Sure, but what about purchasing a baby from another woman because you can't have one naturally? Maybe because you waited too long, you wanted to be a girl boss, whatever. That's sovereignty. You can do whatever you want. Don't get married, be a girl boss, but you still get to purchase a baby. It's complete female dominion. But I know people are gonna get angry at this. Women can kill their children. They can sell their children. They can buy their children. That's power. Get angry at it. I don't care. That's power. And you, like a good little boy, say, well, it's not fair to women, really. It's about the exploitation of women. Was I good, mommy? Because the conservative movement in this country is run by women, homosexuals, and worst of all, perhaps, men who are controlled by women, by their wives, whatever. So I can say this while loving and respecting women, which I do, because I understand that it is the responsibility of men to build and maintain and restore society. But in order for us to do that, we have to behave like men, be masculine. And if what is most masculine, by definition, is what is least feminine, then we have to abandon political correctness and speak about things honestly without having to be held hostage by the emotions of people who may not like our tone, which is what I have just done. I don't blame women. I don't hold women responsible, really. It's our job, but that starts with abandoning this weak, simp mindset, the simp mind virus, as it were, so we can actually protect our children and restore our country. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel. Uh, remember to leave the comment. I don't know if I'm going too fast for you. Also like the video, leave it a thumbs up. It's right there. You probably liked the video. If you made it this far, you liked the video. Why not reflect that through, through clicking? What's wrong with you? I haven't earned it. I've been up since, well, I'm not going to do that. I won't complain, but like the video. I'll wait. Everyone teachers will do that. Um, yeah, uh, to subscribe, uh, turn on post notifications so that you are notified in the event that I post, which is so frequently. And then, of course, share the video with a friend. Everyone's going to want to see this. No one's going to get mad at this. Women aren't going to get mad at this. No one's going to get mad at this. Gay people are going to love it. Uh, everyone's going to love it. I'm, look, I'm just a normal guy with normal opinions, okay? Um, the one thing that I'm going to get in trouble for, though, is John Doyle's making a case for prostitution. No, I'm not. I, I said I'm going to arrest these people, too, which I am. I am perfectly coherent on this. The left is perfectly coherent on this. It's the people in the middle who are like, yeah, what well, they both sound like you're making arguments in favor of prostitution. <laughs> it's all the same. You don't get it. Rewatch the video. Rewind. Go back. Why? That way. Which way? Yeah, that way. Click that way. Rewatch. I did not say that. We just have to understand what the problem is and we have to speak about it honestly. I'm sorry if you didn't like my tone. I really am. I didn't mean to, you know, use that tone with you. I don't know. Uh, Merry Christmas. I don't think I'll see it. Well, I don't think you'll see me in our sort of relationship here as it stands. Um, but yes, Merry Christmas. I will see you again before the new year. I hope you enjoy time with your family, with your friends. Uh, yeah. Do I do the bobble thing if it's his birthday? Do I, is it, do I get like a special one? Um, I got to cut these outros. The two minute outro, folks. The videos are long. The outros are long. The periods between uploads are long. It is what it is. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else to say. We covered everything. I did have some other stuff, but a lot of that's going to go in the aforementioned dissertation. Um, there were some things I would have liked to have explored in this conversation, but we just didn't get to it. 
Um, so yeah, we will do that. We will do that. Okay. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Have a very Merry Christmas. God bless you. God bless your family. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Poof.